I've given a couple of Raglan talks before, um, and I don't want to go back over the stuff that I discussed last time, so I'm going to try and jump ahead and talk about a few new things. And I don't want to make this an academic discussion. I don't want to be a propeller head because there's enough of them already. I want to give you some, um, some of my thoughts about what I think are practical things that we can do with our geochem data. And this is in two parts. It might be really brave or it might be really dumb and it might not work out, but we'll see. I want to give you some background into the way I would go about interrogating a data set first. And we'll have to go into a bit of theory about mineralogy and chemistry to, to give you the background for that. And then I'm going to give a live demo using some data that we've got permission to use from Northern Star. Um, it is really unusual to, for the general public to get access to a company data set. And what Northern Star have done here to allow us to use this is just fantastic. So thanks, Jamie and the Northern Star guys. Uh, so, so this is the dangerous bit. I'm going to do a live demo in IOGAS showing you how I would pull apart a cross section of data across the super pit. And I've got this written up and it's been distributed around. So hopefully I've got some self-guided uh, tutorial notes that you can follow and replicate this process for yourself. And then you can see, um, compare with what I'm going to discuss today, or you can listen in today and try and replicate this process for you tomorrow. But this is a really, really fantastic learning opportunity. I um, ummed and ahed about what I was going to do for an introduction here, and I've kind of rewritten three or four different drafts of this. And then I saw a paper last week, published paper. You're not allowed to say where it's from if you know where it's from. But um, this is kind of an analogy for what we're doing in the Yilgarn and how we merge together what we can see structurally and what we can see from the chemistry. So this was a, a published paper on a base metal system a protozoic based metal system, zinc rich. And these guys have written a fantastic paper. This is a, a base metal system that's had um, four episodes of deformation. And they have related the spatial distribution of sulfides to various um, shear zones and dilational zones, low pressure zones within a deforming rock package. Really, really well written, fantastic illustrations, right? Except that this is a system that I've worked on. I've deliberately left the names off this because I don't want to um, criticise what these guys have done. It's really nicely written paper. But when you bring in other data sets, you'll have a different view about what's going on here. So this is a system with, I don't know, 50 million tonnes at 10% zinc and a heap of lead and a little little bit of silver. What I know about this is that in the stratigraphic sequence, there's a siliciclastic unit on one side, there's a limestone on the other side, and there's a carbonaceous shale that's host to the mineralization. That sounds pretty much like any protozoic base metal system, but that doesn't prove anything. Geochemically, this thing is absolutely flooded with K feldspar. And K feldspar flooding is a really distinctive characteristic of SEDEX systems. Doesn't prove anything. The, the host sequence here is um, a metallic, uh, organometallic shale. So it is loaded with a really weird suite of metals that accumulate with organic material. So it's highly enriched in vanadium and moly and uranium, right? So this is a really, really metalliferous shale that's host to the mineralization. That's a really common signal in SEDEX deposits, right? It doesn't prove that this is a SEDEX system because these guys have attributed the 
accumulation of metals here entirely to an orogenic process. Well, they've described this as an orogenic base metal system. The next thing is the, the pathfinder elements that are most highly enriched here relative to average crustal abundance are antimony and mercury. Right? So if anybody's done Geochemistry 101, you will know that they are elements that normally precipitate at really low temperatures. This thing is kind of lower amphibolite grade. So the, the pathfinder assembly doesn't really match the, the metamorphic grade within the system. But here's the killer. If I plot potassium versus thallium, most rocks never, ever, ever have more than one to one and a half ppm thallium. So normally thallium substitutes for potassium into, into silicate minerals. There's a, a few deposits around the world, quite rare deposits, where we see thallium sitting in the lattice of pyrite. So this thing is massively enriched in thallium. And there's only a handful of deposit types that have that signal in them. As a geochemist, when I see this, I know, aha, uh -huh, that's one of those sorts of deposits, right? So these guys call it an orogenic system. That's fine, I don't argue with that. The point here is that these rocks have had a really long history. Like these rocks have been around the block quite a few times before D2, D3, D4 turned up. And if these rocks hadn't have had that previous history, this would never have been an ore body, right? So this is a really good analogy. In base metal systems like this, it's really easy to see the chemical signals that tell you about what happened previously. I think the same st stuff happens in Archean gold deposits. It's just that the signals of those earlier events are much more difficult to read. But I'll give you some of my opinions about what happens in the Archean systems. These are just my opinions. You're welcome to disagree. I know some people will. <laughs> um, I don't want to get into academic arguments and stuff, but I'll make a couple of points to begin with. Think about this. If you go into um, Google Scholar and just search for orogenic gold deposits in the Archean, you will find a thousand papers written about Archean deposits and There'll be a really big focus on, on structural geology, as there ought to be. If you look through those papers and see how many of them give adequate descriptions of the alteration mineralogy, right? It might be, it might be one in 10 of those papers will actually tell you what kind of silicate alteration is in the system. If you filter those papers for, for geochemistry, which of those papers actually describe the the geochemical footprints of the gold systems that we would use in an exploration context. Well, crikey, I don't know of many. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The deposits we're looking for often will have a pathfinder signature that includes elements like bismuth and tellurium and antimony, maybe moly, maybe tin, maybe a few other things. If you want to measure those things, um, at a level where you can actually map the footprint of the system, you have to use ICP-MS because no other analytical technique has a detection limit that's low enough, right? We've had commercial ICP-MS for 20 years, but not many people were using it until maybe 10 years ago. So if you're looking for papers on the geochemical footprints of Archean systems, put a filter on it, just look at stuff after 2010, right? You'll find some papers, that, but they'll be, they won't be quantitative, they'll be descriptive, they'll be like cartoons of what the footprints look like. The other thing is that 95% of the papers you ever see will be written by people from universities, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the people in universities won't have big analytical budgets and they won't analyse rocks with the same methods that we use. So in academia, you have to use um, lithium borate fusion so you get a complete digest, so you can measure all the silicates and you can measure a few of the, 
immobile trace elements and know that you've got to complete digestion. So they won't have enough data and they won't have the suite of elements be, to be able to describe what the footprint of the system looks like. Now, if you guys work for Northern Star or Goldfields or Evolution, you will have access to bucket loads of data from lots of deposits and you will know what the varieties of footprints look like. Right? So you've got a few clues about what's going on. If you work for any other company, I reckon you will not have seen enough deposits that you could pick what a near miss would look like. What I'm on about here is that if you're out in the bush drilling a pattern of air core or drilling a few fences of RC and you've drilled a hole that's missed an ore body by 10 metres or 50 metres or 200 metres, what would you see? How would you know that you had a near miss? And if you haven't got that context where you can compare signatures from lots of deposits, you've got no way of knowing that because it's not described in the literature anywhere. And that's why it's such a great thing that Northern Star have given us this data set for today. So I'm going to skip over any of this genetic stuff and we'll get straight on to practicalities. As explorers or as um, mine geos responsible for resources and reserves, the most valuable layer of information we have by a long way is a well-constrained geology map. If you're working in the Yulgarn, all of the constraints you use for your maps come from something like this. All right, so you've drilled some holes and you've got to log the chips and you've got to work out what the rock type is and what the alteration is. How good do you reckon your logging is? I reckon my logging's pretty good. And I reckon if I'm logging chips like this, if I'm lucky, I'll get it right maybe 60% of the time. If you think you're good at logging chips visually, get over the ego. You need to get 4-acid digest ICP MS on your bottom of hole air core chips. And you probably want to get, say, maybe one in 10 down an RC hole. And you want to get some good gear chem out of out of um, your diamond holes as well because it turns out we're not that good at logging lithologies um, and you know you can probably pick a basalt from a porphyry but there'd be lots of different kinds of basalts as Hugh's going to tell you tonight and there'd be lots and lots of different kinds of porphyries and picking those visually is really really difficult and you cannot make a well constrained geology map without using geochem at to help you log better. I'm not just interested in finding out is it porphyry 1, porphyry 2, porphyry 3. What I really want to find out is which of these porphyries is a partial melt from a sulphide bearing mantle source because that's where the gold comes from. You need some way of recognising not just that it's this porphyry or that but understanding where that melt phase came from and what potential it's got to generate a hydrothermal system. Right? So go out and do some proper chemistry. If there's one thing that we could do as an industry, it would be to be more open with sharing data. Right? Data is not knowledge and data is not a competitive advantage. Unless you know what that data means, then it's like not a lot of value to you. The most valuable thing we could do to improve our rate of discovery would be to publish a series of um, deposit footprints. Right? So if you've got you know, Athena load here and you've got Canana Bell out there, if you plot the chemistry on those things and the mag signatures and the geology setting and whatever, 
How big is the tungsten anomaly? How wide does it go? How much arsenic? What amplitude? How wide? All those things that help you understand what a near miss looks like. There's an enormous variety of signatures in arcane gold deposits. They are not all the same. They're really, really different. And unless you know what the variations are and what kind of setting you're in, you won't actually know what a near miss looks like. So if we were able to collaborate and do stuff like that, everybody benefits from it, everybody. That's my sermon for today. Um, so I'm going to talk about 4-Acid Digest ICP Geochem. I'm going to start off pretty gentle and then we're going to go in hard and look at some of the complexities of, of magmatic processes. And then after morning tea, I'll fire up IO gas software and I'll do a live demo on the cross section through the super pit. When you get a 4-Acid Digest analysis, you'll get this list of elements with those detection limits and we want to know what to do with it. So um, I reckon I get a new data set like this with you know thousands and thousands of analyses every week and every time I get a new data set I do the same things. It's the same set of go-to plots I use every time. Take some notes today about the scatter plots I'm going to show you about the magmatic fractionation processes and whatever. What I can do, what we can do in IOGAS now is if you're doing the same process over and over and over with all your data sets, we can set up a whole bunch of shortcuts in IOGAS. I'm really trying to do myself out of a job because I want to retire. I want to, I want to set this stuff up so that I can customize it so you can just plug and play and do your own interp with my own personal cognitive biases. I want you to interpret chemistry the way I would do it. So I can set up all the shortcuts and templates here for you, and you can load your data, open template, click, 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 bang, finished. Right, and then I can go and sit on the beach. So just a few things. There's a bunch of elements in here that Hugh Smithies would call high field strength elements. So these are elements that have a high ionic charge and therefore a relatively small radius. And they tend to be immobile trace elements that don't move around during alteration. Right, so I'm going to do a lot of plots that have things like zirconium and niobium and yttrium. And I put scandium and titanium, vanadium, chrome in there as well. I'm going to hand out these PowerPoints when we're finished and I've got a whole bunch of notes on the notes page so you can read all this stuff at your leisure afterwards. And I've got just as many slides again that are hidden slides so there's lots of extra stuff I'm not talking about to save time. So there's a high field strength elements. In the periodic table on the first row of the transition elements these things mostly have chemistry um, that's similar to iron. So these things will substitute for iron into silicate minerals, but there's a few conditions where they will diverge in their behaviour. Right? So a lot of the time they'll be highly correlated, but sometimes they're not. And when you can recognise when those things start to diverge, it tells you about some chemical process that's occurring in those rocks. So I'll do a lot of plots, especially ratios of scandium to vanadium. That tells you a lot about oxidation states and about crystallization of iron oxides versus iron silicates. That's super useful. Think about the way we classify magma types. So like when I was doing Geology 101, we had a petrology lecturer at TAS Uni, Rick Vaughan, and he used to bore the pants off me. Like, I just could not get into the stuff. At least you'll remember Rick Vaughan. But we classify magma types as, commonly as tholeites or calc alkaline or alkaline. So we'll have a quick discussion about what that means. And 
There are calc alkaline magmas generated at high pressure and low pressure that have completely different chemical signatures. And those signatures are really, really easy to read. So we'll show you how to pick those. This is a diagram that I've shamelessly flogged from Bob Laux. And think about a melting process, right? Rocks do not have a melting point, they have a melting range. And that's because it's, rocks are never a pure substance, they're a mixture of minerals, and the minerals are solid solutions, so they all have a melting range. And the range over which they melt depends on the composition of the stuff that you're melting. It depends on, obviously, temperature and pressure and water content. So this is a diagram that Bob Laux drew up for um, a composition of a picritic tholeite. So this is an olivine basalt, assuming that it's water saturated. Right? So there's a certain amount of water will dissolve in a silicate melt. Um, and if, there's, if it exceeds saturation, then there'll be a separate aqueous phase kicking around. Right, so these are, this is water saturated melty in a tholeitic, um, in a, uh, an olivine bearing basalt. Uh, so we're plotting uh, pressure against temperature for the liquidus curves. So once you get above one of these lines in here, everything has melted. So have a look at this. Here's the plagioclase line. If we're in a uh, pressure and temperature environment above that line, actually diagrams upside down, if you're below that line, all the plagioclase has melted. Right? So there's a big domain in here where plagioclase has melted. So anything that's come from here won't show evidence of plagioclase fractionation. There's a line in here for magnetite. All right, so if we're at pressure conditions or temperatures outboard of that line, all of the magnetite will have melted. There's a line in here for hornblende. If we're inside this line, hornblende will be stable. All right, so these things, if they're cooling a bit or the pressure's dropping, they will be crystallising hornblende and we'll see trace element signatures that reflect hornblende fractionation. So magmas that are sitting up in this space in here, like mid-crustal melts, are going to fractionate plagioclase and they're going to fractionate magnetite. And they'll go off on a particular liquid line of descent, like a fractionation trend. Things that sit down in here will fraction, same composition source rock, these things will fractionate hornblende and they'll most likely fractionate titanite and they will have completely different evolutionary paths. Right, so it's really easy to plot this stuff in any bimodal plot and see what kind of magma you've got and where it's come from and how it's likely to fractionate. For the last 10 years I've been working mostly on porphyry copper systems, not on Archean things. Um, and if you work on porphyry coppers, you have to study up on magma chemistry. This stuff is super interesting. If you've done Petrology 101 at university, your lecturers will tell you that zirconium and hafnium and yttrium and thorium and all those high field strength elements are incompatible elements. That means in a melt, there's no common mineral phase that they'll substitute into. So as a melt fractionates, these things become more and more and more enriched in the magma, right? So as the silica content goes up, zirconium goes up, thorium goes up, etc., etc. Porphyry copper magmas are different. This is a um, this is data from a guy who's now the head of the it's taken over from Chris Heinrich in Zurich, running ETH university thing, whatever it is. Um, and so this is a, a set of rocks from a porphyry copper system in southern Peru. And you can see here 
this is um, silica plotted against niobium. As these magmas evolve, niobium reaches a maximum and then starts declining. Right? So in this case, niobium is behaving like a compatible element. That change in trajectory shows when a new mineral phase starts crystallizing, and that mineral is titanite. So titanite is calcium titanium silicate, and niobium substitutes for titanium. So as titanite starts to fractionate, it sucks niobium out of the magma. Not only is it taking niobium, it's also removing yttrium and thorium and some of the zircon and some of the hafnium. Right, so in porphyry copper magmas, these elements start behaving like compatible elements. And it turns out that maybe 60% of Archean granites are like porphyry copper magmas, except they don't have sulfur. Right, so the, the kinds of melting processes that we see in porphyry copper magmas also occurred in the Archean. Nothing to do with subduction. But it's all, about, it's all about the composition of the source material and the water content and the pressure. So we're going to see that in the um, Yilgarn granite data set in a minute. So I'm going to show you a few plots now that I've generated using the barcode data and then the granites database. Um, and we'll look at some of the tools in IOGAS and we'll look at a workflow that you might use to interpret this kind of data. We'll get over the magma chemistry pretty quickly and then we'll get onto the alteration and pathfinder stuff, which is a bit more relevant. But you need to know this stuff. Like I said, there's, there's shortcut things in IOGAS that I'll use a lot. One of the things we can do here is if you're working on the same deposit and you're getting new drill hole data in you know, every month and you're creating the same plots every month, you can, save, uh, you can save a collection of scatter plots called a template. So I can go, I can load a new data set, I can go open, open template, Archean compositions and we go bang, 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 bang and automatically generate all the plots I want to use to classify these rock types. Any stuff you see today, if you want any of this gear for yourselves, let me know. I'll make a set of templates and discrimination diagrams for whatever you want and just hand them out. Let's think about the differences between tholeites and calc alkaline magmas. A tholeite is defined as a, uh, a rock series that shows an iron enrichment trend as it fractionates. So think about melting processes. Tholeites are generated by partial melting of an ultramafic source like a peridotite, something that's got olivines and peroxines and plagioclase and a bit of iron oxide in it. So we're going to heat that up till it starts melting. What are the things that melt first? Right, with, the, with the initial stages of melting, what are the things that melt first? Well, the, the sodic end of the plagioclase series, they'll be the first things that melt, and the iron-rich pyroxenes will melt early, and the iron-titanium oxides will melt early. And as you heat it up more and more, then you start to get more and more magnesium into the melt. Right? I, I do lots of things where I plot scandium on the y-axis, Scandium is going to be substituting for iron into the iron silicates. So when we generate an iron-rich melt with a low degree of partial melting, lots of iron in there, heaps of scandium. Most of the scandium goes in at a relatively low degree of partial melting. So we'll take that batch of magma off somewhere and we'll start cooling it. Now we'll do the same thing in reverse. What crystallizes first? Well, any olivines will crystallize early. The more magnesium-rich pyroxenes will crystallise early. The calcic plagioclase will crystallise early. And the stuff that crystallises last is going to be the iron silicates 
and the iron titanium oxides um, and the sodic plagioclase. So what we see in tholeitic series is that um, as the silica content goes up, the iron content goes up in tholeites. Once you switch over into calc alkaline rocks, then iron goes down as silica goes up. So if you plot iron versus silica, you'll see, you'll see a speed bump like this. If you plot scandium versus silica, you don't see a speed bump, you see a ski jump. Right, there's a massive level shift in scandium because the scandium bearing minerals were the first things to melt and are the last things to crystallize in tholeites. So I see this big gap in here. Um, and that's a really useful thing, you know, when you're plotting your downhole chemistry trying to work out what kind of magma it is, that's really obvious. So I'll have a workflow where I will make a series of scatter plots. And I'll, first thing I'll do is pick out the ultramafics and then the tholeitic magmas and then the calc alkaline magmas. And then I'll work out what kind of ultramafic, what kind of basalt, what kind of felsic. So to start off with, I would do this. I'll plot scandium against magnesium, chrome, aluminium and zirconium. Normally you would pick ultramafics based on the magnesium content but you can't use the magnesium content in rocks that are weathered because the magnesium leaches out really quickly in the saprolite. And there's lots of alteration styles where the magnesium is stripped out really early. So anything that gets strongly albertized will lose all its magnesium. But the chrome will hang around. This is the barcode data. This is really cool. This ellipse of stuff in here scandium versus chrome, these are all the comatiites, right? Things with low scandium and say a thousand ppm chrome, these are high mg comatiites. So there's a chocker block with, with um, forsterite. As the, as the olivines become more iron rich, scandium goes up and chrome goes up. So chrome is really highly correlated with the scandium content in the olivines. There's a bunch of things in here that have more chrome than we can fit into olivines. These are going to be things that have got chromite in them. So if you're, if you're looking for gabbro-hosted magmatic nickel sulfide deposits, you should be really interested in this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting fractionation signatures in those ultramafic to mafic seals that relate to nickel sulfide mineralization. Once we get into tholeitic basalts all the way through to the most felsic things in here, aluminium always occurs within a pretty narrow range regardless of whether it's a high mag basalt or a high silica rhyolite. Isn't that interesting? And if I plot scandium versus zirconium, here's this big compositional gap in here between the tholeites and the calc alkaline rocks. So that's the first thing I'm going to do, go and pick out all the ultramafics and then pick uh, fractionated things within those. Here's something else really cool. If you're looking at fractionation in gabbros, this is Hughes barcode data. So aluminium versus scandium. So these are really MG rich comatiites plotting down in here. So you've got low scandium, but hardly any plagioclase. As we go to more iron rich comatiite types, there's more plagioclase around. So scandium goes up, aluminium goes up, and we end up in tholeite. So these are all plot in a pretty narrow band. In the barcode database, there's about 3000 data points in there. And there's not many of those plot outside that trend. If you're fractionating a tholeite, it's going to involve some process that physically separates pyroxenes and plagioclase. The plagioclase has got aluminium, the pyroxene's got scandium. So if you separate those things, we'll see things with, that are plagioclase rich, they'll have more aluminium and less scandium. 
So these rocks in here are going to have a bucket load of plagioclase. If they're pyroxene rich, they'll have way more scandium and less aluminium. So these things in here are chock-a-block with pyroxenes. Right? Again, any kind of fractionated magmatic intrusion, plot this stuff. Next thing I'll do is plot scandium versus a bunch of high field strength elements. Right, so we can see ultramafics to tholeites in here. But here's this compositional gap, uh, scandium, zirconium, between tholeites and calcalkaline rocks. There's a gap here in yttrium. There's a gap in niobium, etc. And then I'll do the same plot again, except I put titanium first. And then we're comparing the amount of opaque oxides versus the other elements. If I subset the basalts, in the eastern gold fields, we can see a distinction between low thorium, medium thorium, and high thorium basalts. In the super pit, or at St Ives, that's going to correspond to London basalt, Devon Consoles basalt, Paringa basalt. All right, we'll hear a lot more about this tonight. Next thing I'm going to do is subdivide the, the andesitic to felsic rocks. I'm not going to explain europium anomalies. I'll just assume that everybody knows what a europium anomaly is. But this, this is an indicator of plagioclase fractionation. So now this is a plot from Kevin's original granite data set that Hugh's gone and reanalyzed. So here's a plot of europium anomaly against silica. Things that plot up in here have not fractionated plagioclase. Things that plot below this dotted line have fractionated plagioclase. Now that's a, a really obvious first pass distinction we can make with these rocks. So let's look into that a bit more. So I should just go back. I reckon this granite data set that was put together by Kevin and Dave Champion, this is one of the most useful collaborative research projects that's ever happened here. So Dave and Kevin subdivided all of the intrusive rocks in the Yulgarn into things called high calcium granites, low calcium granites, mafic series, you know, things with relatively high magnesium and chrome, high field strength enriched granite types and cyanites. And these are color coded according to their original classification types. If I try a few other plots now, I'm going to plot strontium over yttrium. Rocks that do not fractionate plagioclase will be high in strontium. And that's because strontium substitutes for sodium into plagioclase. And as plagioclase fractionates, it removes strontium from the melt. Some of the yttrium goes into hornblende. A lot of it goes into, oh, sorry, some goes into garnet. A lot of it goes into titanite. So all of those magmas that were sitting above the, the um, liquidus line for plagioclase, they will always have high strontium and low yttrium. So if I plot a strontium yttrium ratio, we can see all of these things that do not fractionate plagioclase versus all of the things that do fractionate plagioclase. It tells you something about pressure, temperature and water conditions where these magmas were generated. Um, I'll go into the vanadium scandium ratio a bit more later. The ones that have a high vanadium scandium ratio have fractionated hornblende. The ones that have a low vanadium scandium ratio have fractionated magnetite. And the really felsic things start to fractionate zircons and that changes the ratio of zirconium to hafnium. One thing you'll see in this data set, there's not a lot of them, but there's a few cyanites in here. The cyanites have crazy high vanadium scandium ratios and have really high 
zirconium hafnium ratios for various reasons. Right. So the, the rocks that fractionate plagioclase and magnetite have high niobium and high yttrium and high thorium because in those magnetypes they're incompatible. In the other magnetypes that are crystallizing titanite, niobium is always low, yttrium is low, thorium is low. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into this. This is all about horn blend fractionation versus magnetite fractionation. Again, that's that same pressure indicator. One of the other things I've done in here is I've gone through the granite database uh, and I've gone through a bunch of papers that are in the public domain and I've picked out intrusions from different gold camps that I think are spatially and genetically related to gold deposits and for the publicly available data on those things I've picked out the median composition of those intrusions and in IOGAS you can set up a mineral compositions table or mineral nodes table I've got all that stuff set up in a rock compositions table I can give that to everybody you can load that into your version of IOGAS you can make a scatter plot and you say Wow, I'd like to compare that to a Granny Smith granite diorite. Click, and it'll appear as one of these one of these dots on your screen. Right? That's a really, really useful reference to have in your stuff. Everybody's welcome to have that. Any company out there who's got gold mineralization spatially linked to porphyries, if you want to send me your data, I can included in this and we'll share it amongst everybody. I love this stuff. It turns out that, um, where's Hugh? Hugh might disagree, but I reckon um, our genuinely alkalic magmas are really, really small proportion of the intrusion types in the eastern gold fields, but they are disproportionately represented in things related to mineralization. Right. probably two-thirds of our deposits sit on top of or adjacent to not just any old sinucatoid, but they sit next to things that are alkalic magmas that have come from a relatively low degree of partial melting from something in the mantle that had gone through an earlier phase of sulphide saturation. Um, and that's why I think this stuff is really, really useful. That's a different story and would be here all afternoon if I wanted to talk about that. Um, a couple more things then we'll get on to the useful stuff. This is a diagram that I would normally only use in altered rocks, but most of the stuff in the granites database are, are analyses of unaltered rocks. So the things here in pink are the rocks that have fractionated a bucket load of plagioclase. The things in green are th have not fractionated plagioclase. And you can see what that does to the alkali contents. All right, so on this diagram, K feldspar is here, albite is here. These are calcic granites, these are potassic granites. All right, so when you're looking at, and these are, these are the cyanides, these are the alkalic things plotting out over here near that tie line between K feldspar and albite. This only works in unaltered rocks, but if you're looking at altered stuff, we've got a really good reference here now as to what the unaltered version of your rocks should look like. And then you can start mapping trajectories here of sericite alteration versus kaolinite versus k feldspar versus albite alteration in those rocks. Really, really useful reference. But you can see the effect of um, different pressure, temperature, and water contents on the way these magma compositions evolve. Now we're on to the good stuff. That's all like, that's all the propeller headgear. Now, one of, the, one of the cool things you can get out of the barcode data is I can filter that data for rocks that are hydrothermally altered. So I can set a threshold for sulfur and for water content 
If it's more than this much sulphur and more than that much water, I'll ignore it. Now I'll see how abundant the Pathfinder elements are in those unaltered rocks. So these are cumulative frequency plots split by compositional groups for different Pathfinders. That's pretty messy, so I'll simplify it for you and put it into a table. Right. This is the far field background. This is the abundance of Pathfinder elements you would see in the Yulgarn in unaltered rocks. So if you're trying to work out how anomalous is my data in arsenic or antimony or tellurium, here's a reference for you to look at that. That's pretty useful. This is the di th when I start plotting alteration, this is the diagram I'll plot every time. So this is a ratio of potassium over aluminium plotted against sodium over aluminium. And why do I plot that? Think about a rock that has been serocitized. So if you started off with one of these um, low calcium granites, we just saw the background was up in here somewhere. If that rock was completely serocitized, if all of the feldspar are shot, so it could end up being quartz, sericite, pyrite, carbonate. In a rock with that mineralogy, all of the potassium and all of the aluminium would be in muscovite. And muscovite is K, Al3, Si3, O10, and a couple of OHs. So potassium to aluminium is one to three. All right, so a rock that's completely serocitized plots down in here. If that was completely altered to K feldspar, it would plot here. If it was completely altered to albite, it would plot over in here. Okay, so I've made a summary. Of all the data sets I ever look at, there's four common alteration patterns. I commonly see things that plot on the tie line between orthoclase and albite, but they're nearly always down near the albitic end. So we see these albite K feldspar things. Oh, that's, that's one really typical alteration type. Another common alteration type would be things that plot on the tie line between albite and sericite. Right, so there'll be things that plot in here. You see other things that are strongly sericitized, plus or minus chloride. So if it's all sericite, it plots in here. If it's got chloride mixed with it, it'll plot a bit lower. And this is another type we see not so often. There's a really, really linear trend in this data that runs from the muscovite node down towards the paragonite node. So these things are a physical mixture of muscovite and paragonite. So I can, I can plot 95% like of all the Archean data sets of proximal alteration, and it'll be one of those four categories. So here's an example. This is from Granny Smith. The, the things here in pale blue are the sediments, that the, you know, the um, laid basin stuff that the Granny Smith granodiorite intruded into. This is a relatively unaltered Granny Smith granodiorite. It's a hornblende porphyry. It's got a pretty alkalic signature. Uh, and that stuff will be barren. This is the same rock that's moderately altered, and that's probably got half a gram of gold. And this stuff is strongly altered. So you can see this reaction pathway heads out to that tie line between orthoclase and albite, and then starts heading down towards albite. And this stuff will be three or four grams per ton. All right, so you can see this is one of those um, albite K feldspar trends in an intrusion. If you think about how that relates to the Pathfinder signatures, right, we're going from things that are chock-a-block full of feldspar to things that are feldspar with sericite to lots of sericite to like what would normally be clay-rich alteration. 
The things that are full of feldspar will almost always have big molly anomalies. These have lots of molly and probably anomalous bismuth and tellurium as well. As a generalisation, well, that's not not one to one, but that's commonly what you see. Things on the albite sericite line in here, typically you'll have more bismuth and tellurium. Things that plot near the muscovite node will typically have lots of arsenic. And things that have this paragonite trend will have bucket loads of antimony. Right, that's, a, that's a temperature trajectory. Things that plot up around the muscovite node commonly have heaps of cesium. Things that plot down in here commonly have lots of lithium. So this is, this is the golden mile data set in here on a molar ratio diagram, colored 10 equal ranges of arsenic contents. So you can see the high arsenic up near the muscovite node. Just for context, this is another really good paper written by a Kiwi, so it's got to be good. This is from um, Isabel Chamberfort, and she did a lot of geochemical work on the active geothermal systems in New Zealand. So this is the Taupo volcanic zone. Just to give you a bit of context, right? Here's Lake Taupo, um, here's Rotorua, and the, the red things in here are the active geothermals. So Isabel and John Dillis looked at these geothermal systems in here. And they've measured all the mineralogy down that the production well holds. Uh, and they've measured all the trace element chemistry on those. So I'm going to plot some of the, some of the elements um, against elevation. And so this is um, meters relative to sea level for gold, arsenic, antimony, cesium, lithium, and tungsten. Some of the analyses in this are pretty old and a bit dodgy, especially tungsten. But in particular, look at antimony. Right, so here's one ppm antimony. By the time you get stuff that's consistently above one ppm antimony, within one to one and a half kilometers of the of the current surface level. Right, so this is stuff that is 250 degrees or less. Right, most of this high antimony stuff will be dropping out at 200 degrees. There's a bit of a bias in arsenic, but not as much as there is for antimony. Um, there's not enough data in lithium, but if you saw more, this would be the high lithium end here within probably within half a kilometre of the surface. Here's the profile for cesium. I just want to give you that stuff for context, just to demonstrate that these things really are linked to depth and therefore temperature. All right, so here's the, here's the full golden mile data set. And, um, we're going to look at a little subset of this stuff after afternoon tea, but there's, um, there's about 60,000 analyses in here. Here's the molar ratio diagram, so albite, muscovite, paragonite. 90% of the rocks in here are mafic, so the initial starting composition is down in here. But you can see this really, really distinct linear trend in that data. That's a physical mixture of muscovite and paragonite. Oh, there's bucket loads of paragonite in here. And here's the probability plots for antimony and cesium in that data. So in this data set, the most anomalous pathfinder element is antimony. Here's the, here's the background level for antimony from the barcode data at about 0.5 ppm. The median value the median analysis for antimony in the golden mile data set is 5 ppm. That is a bucket load of antimony. And here's cesium. Uh, cesium is a great big fat ass cation 
that doesn't, it, it would like to go out with white mica, but it's too fat. It doesn't easily fit into the lattice. So it won't substitute into the phyllosilicates until the system's really cooled down and the white mica structure is more disordered. So it turns up in the low temperature phyllosilicates. So there's a bucket load of cesium sitting around the margins of, of the Fimiston loads in the Golden Mile. So thanks to Northern Star for that data. Thanks to Kin Mining for this data. This is Leah Moore's data set from Cardinia. I haven't seen Leah around, but this is another cracking good data set. This stuff is not just proximal to the loads. This is like their entire district. So we're seeing a bit more distal stuff in here. And Cardinia has got a few more felsic rocks and not so many mafics. But again, you see this kind of muscovite to paragonite mixing trend. And more of this is up towards the muscovite end because the initial starting composition in these things is more felsic, right? But otherwise it's no different. Lots of antimony, lots of cesium. That's pretty cool. Here's another one. So this is Kandana, muscovite in here, paragonite in here. There's a lot of data. It's not quite so clear cut, but this is a data set that's taken over a broader area. This is not just proximal stuff. Most of the rocks in here are andesitic compositions. So these would be the bomby andesites that sit above the Victoria Shale. And this would be the andesitic volcanoclastic package between the, between the Bentry basalt and the powder sill. So these rocks should have an initial composition that plots out over here somewhere. And now most of it plots in here. And it looks strangely like that mixing line between muscovite and paragonite. Uh, so, and again, there's a lot of far-field data, but there's some really high antimony and really, really high cesium in these rocks. This looks like a low temperature pathfinder signature in these rocks. When you look at the rocks, they actually look like this. This is a little subset now of that data set. This is just Victoria's basalt. And this is where you shouldn't ever believe geochemists who haven't looked at the rocks. If you looked at this data without ever seeing the rocks, you'd say, aha, uh -huh, look at that. That's a serocyte alteration trend. All this data is on a trajectory that's going straight towards muscovite. That's got to be chock-a-block for the white micas. When you go and look at it, the stuff that plots up this end near the muscovite node looks like this. This is a mixture of biotite and a really, really calcic plagioclase. Right, so it's a mixture of a mineral that plots up there and a mineral that plots down in here. And those minerals are always present in a proportion such that it plots at the muscovite node. Right? That is not hydrothermal. That is a metamorphic assemblage. And the stuff that plots down in here has got lots and lots of lithium, lots of cesium, lots of antimony. It's got actinolite and a slightly more sodic plagioclase and a little bit of biotite. You cannot get that trend through a metamorphic reaction. So if you go back to that initial thing I was talking about with the base metal system that had been metamorphosed, and we can see, well, actually something happened to those rocks before it got deformed by D2. This is the kind of evidence that you see in our rocks. We're seeing uh, a mineral assemblage here that is not compatible with the whole rock chemistry. These rocks had been altered before they got metamorphosed. Right? If these rocks had not been through that earlier metamorphic event, could you hit this stuff with D2, D3, D4 and make an ore body? Almost certainly not. It's a combination of events that, that creates ore grade mineralization. And it's really, really hard to see back through 
all of those metamorphic events to see what happened there originally. And in all the discussions we've had about arcane gold systems, that's the big thing that we've been missing. We have found it so difficult to see back before what happened prior to the metamorphism. Here's another example uh, out of the literature. This is stuff that was done by Sean Hood and a couple of other dodgy blokes from Taz Uni, from Codes. And they've got a molar ratio plot that's asked about to the way I would plot it. So they've got sodium aluminium ratio on the Y axis, potassium aluminium on the X axis. This is the data from, from Hamlet. I'd say one of the high grade veins from, from St. Ives. Here's a photo of the face underground. So outboard, it's full of chlorite. Here there's a biotide dominant zone. In the middle of the vein array in here, it is albite plus biotite. And you can see on their molar ratio diagram, the data points are sized according to the gold grade. So this is albite and biotite. And here's a tie line between albite and muscovite. Right. Undoubtedly, this is an orogenic vein system. But if it's albite and biotite, why does it plot on the albite muscovite tie line? So these rocks have been metamorphosed. This must have been a combination of um, albite and muscovite that's been cooked up beyond the temperature stability range of the white micas. So now we're into black mica stability. So all the atoms get rearranged, or the potassium is going to piss off out of white mica and go into black mica. It's going to suck iron and magnesium out of the chloride. And, and the carbonate, some of the calcium is going back into feldspars. So this is now going to be a physical mixture of some feldspar composition that plots here and biotite that plots over here. But it's always in a proportion such that it sits on top of the albite to muscovite tie line. Right. That's a metamorphic reaction of a hydrothermally altered rock that was originally albite, muscovite, with a bit of chloride and a lot of carbonate. You can see where this plots on the albite to muscovite tie line. What do you reckon the dominant pathfinder signature is going to be in that? And it's going to be like mostly bismuth. The, the most diagnostic pathfinder in this will be bismuth not arsenic. This would be a relatively low arsenic load. So conclusions. Um, I've got no idea how long I've taken here. But can't see the clock. Um, the most important layer of information that you will put together in your exploration or in your resource reserve definition drilling is a geology map. If you're not updating your geology map after every drill campaign, um, you, you're not doing yourself any favours, mate. Like geology is the most important thing you'll ever do. And you will make way better geology maps if you use the geochemistry to help you log the rocks properly. Pathfinder elements form halos around all bodies and the pathfinder patterns will change depending on what geological environment you're in. If you're down near um, alkalic intrusions, those things would be chock a block for the feldspars, and they have lots of moly, lots of bismuth, lots of tellurium. If you're way up near the contact between the basalts and the overlying sediment packages, they'll be full of arsenic and full of antimony. So the pathfinder footprints vary depending on where you are within the system. And it's really useful to um, have some standard way of looking at the pathfinder element distributions. So you can map the halos around potentially mineralized structures. When you come to drill those targets, don't drill the geochem anomaly, drill the structure that those things are bleeding off. Right? So 
the geochemistry will help you map the footprint of the hydrothermal system. Once you know where the hydrothermal system is, then you want to call in Brett or Trippy to put together a structural model and go and drill the structural targets in. Don't bother with the structural stuff earlier on because like 99%, 90 percent of the yield gun is never going to be mineralised and you're going to be wasting your time in rocks that are never ever going to have an ore body in them. Don't make exploration more complicated than it needs to be. Like, mate, this stuff is pretty straightforward. You just got to do something that is effective and just apply it consistently. And if we all collaborate and share these atlases of footprints, we will all have a much better idea of what a near miss is going to look like. You can disagree with any of that, that's fine, I don't care. <laughs>